Hello everyone. I hope all are doing well and looking forward to the time when we can be together again uh, real soon. Beginning next Wednesday night, we will begin our summer series again in the same basic format. So be looking forward to that. We're going to be studying the uh, works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit from Galatians chapter five. So have your Bibles open, be ready for uh, our different speakers as we begin that uh, next Wednesday night. Tonight, I would like in our last time together on Wednesday nights uh, before our summer series is to look at the book of Philemon. And I've chosen Philemon for a few reasons. This is uh, another one of Paul's uh, Roman imprisonment epistles that he wrote uh, during the time of Acts chapter 28, uh, while he was uh, in Rome, and the church was uh, established at Caesar's house, as we've learned from the book of Philippians. And now the book of Philemon is another one of those personal letters that Paul is going to write to, to an individual, to Philemon. So this, uh, this book is going to be very uh, applicable as well, I believe, as he's writing from isolation. And this is one of the greatest psychological books in all of the Bible. It's amazing how he is going to deal with the mind, the spirit of uh, the Christian, the good faithful Christian Philemon, as he is an owner of a slave. And uh, it seems, it appears from this context, that uh, slave, uh, slave owner relationship is not exactly like it was in, in our country. Uh, not as much mistreatment, not as much uh, uh, slavery as we would define that term. You know, many terms uh, have a way of changing meanings. Well, no doubt this is one. This is one. Not the best of relationships, which can be said of a lot of relationships, but it probably wasn't exactly parallel to, uh, to slavery as we know it in the, uh, in the early foundings of, of, of this country. When we look at a slave-master relationship here, um, it's probably more like an employee-employer relationship, uh, at least with a lot of those characteristics. So what is happening is that Philemon, Onesimus was working for Philemon, and there were some troubles that came up in that relationship, and Onesimus left Philemon. Well, after he had left, Onesimus was converted to Christ. And Onesimus became a, uh, a great help. Following his conversion, uh, he was a great help to the Apostle Paul. But the Apostle Paul was not of the mind to just take Onesimus as his own, but he's writing Philemon to take Onesimus back. And again, Philemon was a faithful Christian. Now Onesimus is a faithful Christian. And Paul had some dealings here with Onesimus and grew him in, uh, in his walk with Christ. And so Paul is hoping that Philemon would take Onesimus back and things could be good between them and the gospel would go on. So there are many, many uh, good lessons in this book. And uh, it's a good book to study as far as Christian maturing is concerned. And so hopefully we can get a lot from our time together. In Philippians chapter 1, we're introduced, uh, well, we aren't really because we've just studied another one of Paul's epistles, but we're told who the writer was and uh, who the recipient was. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. Notice that Paul here is uh, mentioning that he is a prisoner. But this brief letter, which was written from a Roman prison, is not being written styled in the idea that Paul is a prisoner of Rome. He never emphasizes 
his being a prisoner in Rome or any anywhere else or to anyone else, only a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And in this very introduction, there is a great lesson. To whom or to what do we see ourselves as prisoners? Or where do we place the emphasis? Now, are you in prison to anything? Are you enslaved to anything or to anyone? Or does your portrayal of your life indicate a willing prisonership to Jesus Christ? See, this is what Paul would do. Paul didn't consider himself a prisoner of anyone or anything other than our Lord. And these were shackles not placed upon him because of his lifestyle, because of his sin, but it was a chain that Jesus Christ laid upon him and he took that chain willingly. And he was able to use it for greater blessing in his life. It was like a badge of courage. It was a, it was a badge of office, if you will. Many times in the writings of the Apostle Paul, he would talk about bearing the marks, the literal physical marks that he had in his body from the beatings that he took and from the stonings that he took. Remember when he was stoned and left for dead at Lystra? Remember in 2 Corinthians, the, the, the perils at sea and the shipwreck and all those things? He was being a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He was deciding to live this way. And so these marks in his body and this imprisonment, he considered that a great thing and a badge of his office in Christianity. Even uh, and, and other apostles thought this way. When the apostle Peter was crucified, supposedly as he requested upside down, his badge of discipleship, his badge of office was glorifying God, even his, in his death, like all the apostles suffered martyrdom at the hands of men, but they weren't really killing these men, not really killing the soul. This is what they signed on for. And you and I as well are to be faithful unto death and wear our badge of office, not wanting to worry about these things in life that put us in prison and captivate our minds and take away our focus and our lives from the greater calling, from the greater lot in life that we have. Oh, what an example this man was, even in this short prison epistle to Philemon from Rome. He uh, addresses the book to Philemon. He said that he was a Christian brother. He, uh, he was from Colossae. And this is the only place in the New Testament that Philemon is mentioned. Oh, but what a mention it was. Paul's relationship with Philemon is shown by something that is significantly missing in the introduction to the book. I believe that Paul wrote 14 of the 27 New Testament epistles. I count Hebrews as one of Paul's epistles Many do not, probably split right down the middle in our brotherhood. Um, I believe there's a lot of compelling evidence that Paul wrote the book of, of Hebrews, but you might, might not believe that. So 13 or 14 books that the Apostle Paul wrote, of those books, nine of them he called himself an apostle. Nine of them, either nine of the 13, nine of the 14. If Hebrews be his, he did not there, nor first and second Thessalonians. The other two were Philippians and Philemon. Personal. Paul would rather take the, uh, the friend approach here and not have to command and as we've seen in the book of Philippians, there are a lot of psychological principles given in order to motivate the church at Philippi and Philemon to do the right thing without having to be 
commanded to do it. You know, the Holy Spirit expects us to use our minds and our love for him to motivate us to do what we do in his service. And so it's with that idea, and isn't that a good idea? Wouldn't we rather as parents to children or with employers to employees, wouldn't it be wonderful, or masters to slaves, as we have here in this book of Philemon, wouldn't it be better if we could motivate them to do the right thing without having to give them an ultimatum every time? Unlike the book uh, to, uh, to the Corinthians, where Paul was stating in, in, one, uh, in one case in the second letter that he was going to bring a rod if they didn't jump in line. You know, sometimes that has to be done, but it's so much better when it doesn't. And so in these personal, these more personal letters to the Philippians and to Philemon, Paul doesn't invoke his apostleship, which implied, listen, I've got the authority over you to say this. He didn't do that here. And to me, that is very interesting. In verses two and three, Paul says to the beloved Apphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier and to the church in your house, the church in your house. Does that sound familiar? When my family gathers to worship, guess what? The church is in our house. When you are worshiping with your family, the church is in your house. When we get together collectively at the church building, the church is in the building. The church is not the building. The church is not something we go to. Oh, will that long entrenched thought ever leave our minds? No, faithful children of God who are worshiping him do not go to church. They are the church that goes to worship, no matter what the setting is. If it's in a house, if it's in a rented hall, if it's under a tree, that's not to say that everything we do in those places is worship, but when we commit our minds to worship, worship has a beginning time, it has an ending time, and it can happen anywhere. But here he's writing to the church in Philemon's house. Uh, Apphia was probably the wife of Philemon, and Archippus was probably the son. This address to the family members is unique among the letters of the Apostle Paul. It's much like the epistles of John, those personal letters, particularly 2nd and 3rd John, written to individuals. So this idea makes sense considering the content of the letter to Philemon. In this letter, Paul is going to appeal to Philemon regarding, as we've said, this runaway slave, who has obeyed the gospel, has become a Christian, and found refuge with Paul. In the customs of the day, Philemon's wife, Apphia, would have been the supervisor of the slaves, especially in that household. He says to the church that is in your house, Many times the Christians of a city, because of persecution, probably not so much a virus, had to meet in their homes for, for worship. So Paul addresses them as the church in their home, in their house. Grace to you and peace. This is a customary uh, greeting, as we know, of the Apostle Paul. And it's found in each one of his letters. And this greeting was not directed now to an entire congregation, but it was directed personally. I want to ask a question here. When we read any book of the New Testament, whether it's uh, addressed to an individual or to a congregation, do we take it when we're reading it individually as individuals and apply the principles individually? 
We need to do that. The, uh, the other epistles that were written to preachers, commonly called in the religious world the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus, were also written to individuals by the Apostle Paul. And the context of these letters were intended, however, to be shared with entire congregations. So we see the way that these are to be applied. In verses 4 through 7, Paul says, I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayer, no doubt uh, a synecdoche here, hearing of your love and your faith, which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. A faithful Christian does this. I want to know when people hear your name, do they think, of your love that you have for the church and for all the saints as individuals. Think about that. When people hear my name or anyone's name as a faithful Christian, what's their first thought? Is their thought something that goes along the lines of what Paul thought about Philemon? That the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you. Boy, what a, what a thought to be able to think about someone, a, a brother or sister in Christ. He says, for we have great joy and consolation in your love. Because the hearts of the saints are refreshed by you, brother. The model of a Christian. This is Paul, the great apostle Paul, saying this about Philemon. Oh, that the Lord could say this about us. Uh, he thanks God and he makes mention of Philemon always in his prayers. Paul prayed often for Philemon. I doubt that Paul, every time he uttered a prayer, had Philemon's name in it, but it was a lot. How many times do we take our brothers and sisters before the, name, before the throne of God, not just when they're sick? We don't have any indication that, uh, that Philemon was in the hospital or... Uh, he was sick in any way, but Paul mentioned him always. And how many times did he mention him because of his work's sake? How many times do we take our brothers and sisters to God because of their work's sake and because of the love they have for the people of God? In, in Paul's letters, in his epistles, at least four times he says that he makes mention for people to the Romans to the Ephesians, to the Thessalonians, and now here to Philemon. Uh, this doesn't indicate that, pro, that Paul always prayed long, intricate prayers for Philemon, but he mentioned him often, many times. He heard of their faith and love, and this should describe us all, his, his sharing of the faith, that is why someone becomes a Christian, to perpetuate himself and to make other Christians. And so we need to ask ourselves this question. How many people have we influenced? How many people have we targeted? And how many of those have become Christians? Philemon was a true Christian in every sense of the word. This is what the foundation for effective Christianity, for effective evangelism is the overflow of a life touched and changed by God to where they can't help but speak a good word for the master. It's possible here that Paul means in the sharing of faith, since this word is koinonia, joint participation, sharing. Many times, this is a general word in the Greek language, and many times it references a physical blessing, sometimes money. Remember, Paul says that sometimes 
uh, congregations and individuals did not uh, did not share with me. Uh, that's koinonia, just same word here, but probably is is coming from more of a spiritual aspect than a physical one. Uh, the hearts of the of Christians have been refreshed by him, and that is such a, a great thing to be able to be said. So here's Paul now, beginning in verse 8, on his plea in behalf for Onesimus. He says, therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting. See, here's the idea. He didn't mention that he was an apostle and, and pull rank, so to speak. I could be bold to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake, I would rather appeal to you. I would rather beg you. And Paul did a lot of begging in his writing. I beseech you. I beg you by the mercies of God. What? Present your bodies a living sacrifice. I beg you to have the, the mind of Christ as he, told the, as he told the Corinthians. He says here, now here, here comes the psychological part. I beg you as being Paul the aged. Paul was uh, in, in the zenith of his life. He was coming down the home stretch just as much in, uh, in spiritual control of his life as, as at any time, perhaps even more so. And he says, listen, Philemon, who was younger than him, I'm begging you as the old man. I'm begging you as Paul the aged, and I'm begging you as a prisoner in chains, but again, of Jesus Christ. I appeal to you for my son, not in the flesh, but Paul probably baptized him. I am begging you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains. Paul again is showing his evangelistic nature and his desire even when he is in prison. He was once unprofitable for you. When he was working in your house, he was not the man he needed to be. He was not the employee. He was not the slave that he needed to be. Not at all. You know, a loving appeal is often better than an authoritative command when it can be done. Paul wasn't hesitant, as we know from his other letters. He wasn't hesit hesitant to command when he needed to. But only when the situation demanded it. This is wisdom. This was wisdom that is a little bit differently defined than knowledge. Knowing when to apply and how to apply that knowledge. Paul the aged, Paul and in prison. I'm loving you, Philemon. I love you as Paul just got done building Philemon up spiritually. Now I'm getting ready to lower the boom, if you will. I want you to do something that might not seem natural. I want you to take up your cross. I want you to go the, the second mile in Christianity. And I want you to take Philemon back. I need a favor, this old man, who's been a, through a lot for you. I need you to do me a favor. I, I'm going to appeal for the slave, your slave, Onesimus. But if you do that, I think there'll be great, uh, there'll be great reprisals, good reprisals, if you do this. It seems like when Onesimus escaped, he would have fled to Rome. Intentionally or not, he met up with Paul, who was under house arrest from the Romans. He leads Onesimus to the faith. He has begotten him in his chains. And it was logical that Onesimus escaped to the biggest city of the Roman Empire where there were many uh, offscorings, if you would, of humanity. He could get lost in the crowd and perhaps, you know, find something that would help him physically. Paul often spoke of his converts 
as his sons or his daughters, his children. Remember, he referenced Timothy as his son in the faith. Titus, the same way, the Corinthian and Galatian Christians, uh, they were all called Paul's children. How many children do we have in Christianity? Especially those that are older, how many sons and daughters have we begotten in Christ? He, uh, he mentions to Philemon, listen, Onesimus was once unprofitable for you. Have there been people in your life that were once unprofitable to you and then they repented? What was your mindset? as you would have been commanded by God to take them back? Or have you ignored them all of these years? What has been your response to those who have repented? In some way, we don't know exactly how Onesimus became profitable to Paul. Perhaps he served as his assistant to Paul during his house arrest. So he was able to know and get to know Philemon well. Uh, when Paul spoke of Onesimus being unprofitable and then profitable, he made a play on a word. The name Onesimus means, guess what? Profitable. Now, I know Onesimus was given this name before this time, but do you suppose that this was providential? Now that he was a Christian, Onesimus was going to be able to live up to his name. What does your name mean? What does your given name mean? My name, Matthew, means gift of God. I'm wondering if I'm living up to that name. What does your name mean? I bet it has some Christian or biblical principle to it. Are you living up to it? But we really need to ask ourselves, are we living up to our spiritual name, Christian? Are we worthy of that name? High standard, isn't it? Paul then sends Onesimus back with the hope that Philemon will allow him to return. He says here, beginning at verse 12, I'm sending him back. You therefore receive him. That is my own heart, my own mind, my own spirit. Paul had a keen understanding what it meant to live a sinful life, and then a, being able to receive God's grace and mercy and forgiveness and being taken back by God, by being redeemed. Philemon, I want you to redeem Onesimus. And if you do, if you have enough faith to do this, and love for the old man here in chains, you are going to enjoy the blessings but do it as my own heart, to keep with me, to be in fellowship with me. Oh, what psychology this is. That on your behalf, he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. I'm still going to be able to use him, but he's going to be better used under your auspices, and he will still be able to help me. But without your consent, I, want, I wanted to do nothing because... He, you know, he worked for you first. But I want you to willingly take it back so that your good deed, here, here, here's some more, here's some more counseling, so that your good deed might not be by a compelling nature by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. Oh my, do I have to uh, uh, extend forgiveness? Do I have to lead somebody to Christ? Do I have to go to worship? Do I have, you know, no, you don't. You have the right to live life any way that you choose. But you know what the Holy Spirit is saying here through the Apostle Paul? 
and to us. It is so good to be a volunteer. I'm sending him back. Receive him. Well, I wish to keep him with me, but it's not about what I want personally. It's what is going to be best for the cause. Oh, what a mind the Apostle Paul had. And hopefully we can live with this mind. It's not about me personally. I'm taking up my cross daily. It's not primarily about, did you offend me? Did you not speak to me? Did you not treat me right? Did you make a decision I didn't like? Did you, did you, did you, did you? You know, that's what most counseling is about. It's trying to get people to get out of themselves and not focus on how you treated me, but how I need to treat you. It's amazing how the personal application to these kinds of things lead to the desired response that you want. And sometimes it takes more than one or two efforts to, to bring that about. But realizing all along, as we strive to do that, God is being served, God is being loved, God is being pleased. That's why Paul is doing this. Philemon, if you leave Onesimus with me, it's like you serving me because Onesimus is your rightful servant. Well, in verse 15, Paul then explains the providential hand of God at work in Onesimus, in Onesimus' escape. You and I can't always pinpoint the providence of God, but we know, we know that whoever loves the Lord and would be a part of his called out people, God's special providence is at work because all things will work out for his or her betterment. And Paul now, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, is able to pinpoint God's providence at least, maybe not pinpoint it, but get a little more specific than the general idea that we have. He still still uses the word perhaps, but he really believes it is. For perhaps, he says, he departed for a while for this purpose. I hope you have Romans 8.28 by this verse. This is an application of it that you might receive him forever, not just in this life, but receive him throughout all of eternity. What a good thing to think about and to talk about in heaven, uh, Philemon, that you did the Christ-like thing and you returned good for the evil that Onesimus gave you when you had him before, but he's not gonna do that again. He's truly converted to Christ. That lifestyle, those addictions, those mindsets are gone. This should give us a picture of how we should become a Christian and how we should think when we become a Christian. Does anything control us? That thing is sinful. That thing must be given up. And so Paul is pleading for this to happen. And Paul is pleading specifically to Philemon to help Onesimus and to keep this faithfulness coming. In other words, to allow Onesimus to continue to walk in the light. The best place he can be is at your home, Philemon, for many reasons, as we've seen that you may receive him forever, not the least of which. Well, Paul reintroduces Onesimus to Philemon, now not as a slave, but as a brother. In this relationship, the brotherhood far exceeds the master-slave-employee-employer relationship. Paul effectively abolishes the sting of the master-slave relationship. You know, that kind of, 
of ideas should not be had in a marriage or in any kind of relationship. Uh, relationship. Forced slavery is wrong in any setting. This should be free will offerings, whether it's in an employee-employer relationship, whether it's in a husband-wife relationship, or a friend-friend relationship. If a man is a stranger, I might make him my slave from some ungodly way. But how can my brother any longer be my slave? The word inherently gives the impression of ungodliness. No, you don't accept him now as a you repent too if you had anything to do with slavery as it's modernly defined now. I mean, Paul's even taking away that part from Flint. You accepting him as you would accept me, not as a slave, but as a brother. And then beginning at verse 17, Paul says, if you then, here's more of the psychology, if you then count me as a partner, if we have this koinonia, this fellowship, this, this brotherhood between us, receive him as you would me. But if he's wronged you in any way, if there, if you have suffered a, a physical detriment, a debt, Philemon, you don't even have to worry about that. I'm paying it all. Paul is paying it all. Don't we have a song like that we sing about Jesus? Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Well, how do we show our appreciation to Jesus for doing this? How we treat, as Jesus termed, these little ones, his little ones. In so much as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, these little ones, you've done it unto me. And woe unto the man that doesn't do that. It'd be better if a millstone be hung around his neck, he'd be cast into the depths of the sea. What is being said to us? We need to receive people back that have done us wrong. And if we're holding a grudge, we better repent of that. We better make it right insofar as it's humanly possible. Receive him as you would me. If he's wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. How much more can Paul spiritually, psychologically, and the two are connected, right? Because the spirit is the mind. Psychology is the state of the mind. Paul is doing this both from a spiritual and a physical standpoint. He's saying, now, how can you not do this? I'm going to even take care of any physical loss you've suffered. How can you do this coming from Paul the aged, Paul that's in prison, Paul who could command you to do it, but not taking that route. I want you to, to, to love all involved to the point where you will deny yourself and trust based on all the evidence. Have faith. You know, without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord, right? Hebrews 11. Put that on my account. Jesus told us the same thing. You know, if you will repent, if you will take your brother back, if you will repent of your own sins, I, I will redeem those. Put all those sins Jesus said on my account. Paul says here to Philemon, put any sin, put any physical thing that, that uh, Onesimus has done before, put that on my account. I'll take care of it. I'll wash it away. Wow. Paul asked that the value of what had been stolen be charged to Paul's account. And I'm writing this with my own hand. I'll repay it. Paul was so serious about that. He gave uh, uh, Philemon a personal IOU, if you will, written by my own hand. 
But just in case all that was missed, now watch Paul, watch what Paul says. Paul says, you owe me a favor. If you haven't been able to put two and two together yet, Paul says, you owe me. Paul says, not to mention to you that you owe me even your own life. How many of us think this way from the receiving end? You know, we owe a lot of people. Paul said this to the Romans. He said, I feel like I'm a debt to everybody. I sinned against society. I sinned against God. So no matter how Paul would have been treated by people, not because they necessarily deserve it, but I owe it. I am a debtor to all men. Beloved, if all of us had this mindset as we live in the church and we weren't worried about how every, what everybody else has done to us, from our spouse, from our employer, from our friends, from our brothers and sisters, if we could have the ability to kick that mess out of our mind, and it is a mess that Satan puts in there, if we could get that out of there and realize, as Paul is telling Philemon, Philemon, you owe me. You know I owe every member at the Woodstock Church of Christ. I owe every member in my household. I owe everybody in my neighborhood. Not because they're all perfect people. Because I'm so not perfect. And Christ was able to establish a relationship with even me. I owe him. And because I owe Jesus Christ, I owe you. And I owe everybody that comes into my eyesight. Yeah, I owe the Jeffrey Dahmers of the world who reportedly became a Christian before before he left. How do I take a person like that back in my own mind? Don't even know Jeffrey Dahmer. But what if I knew him? What if he sinned against me? And we worry about some slight that a brother or sister hurls verbally at our way that was probably not even really thought about when spoken. And we're going to hold that over them. And we're going to... Uh, we're going to hurt a relationship for whom Christ died. How can I treat a brother like that? Boy, we need a good dose of, uh, of Paul, Philemon, and, and Onesimus, don't we? What a great book this is. I think since having studied this again now lately, this is quickly becoming my favorite book. Beginning in verse 20, yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. You owe me this. Look, look at all of these principles. Listen, give me this joy in the Lord. Notice what gives the apostle Paul the greatest joy. Not where he is physically, but how his brothers and sisters respond to the gospel. How those in the world respond to the gospel. Refresh my heart, not by a physical gift, Refresh my heart by doing the right thing spiritually. You know, spiritual people are refreshed mainly spiritually. How are you refreshed? Are you refreshed more when you hear about someone baptized in the Christ or when uh, baptized into the Christ or when you get a stimulus check from the government in the mail? What refreshes your heart more? What refreshes your heart more? A vacation? Or the fact that we can be getting together soon in fellowship and worshiping God together and not having the mindset, oh, I could get used to this uh, worshiping by myself. I can let my brethren go. Oh, my. Oh, my. Refresh my heart. Notice where, Paul says, in the Lord. Not in mammon. Not in money. Not in things. Not in stuff. Refresh my heart in the Lord. That's the only place where a true Christian's heart can be refreshed. It's like when, when we repent, the angels in heaven throw a party. They rejoice. Paul is going to be rejoiced by Philemon's right, voluntary, godly choice. In verse 23, as he wraps up the book, Paul sends greetings to Philemon from common friends who were with him in Rome. Epaphras, his fellow prisoner, 
uh, in Christ Jesus greets you as do Mark. Remember Mark, he repented as well. Paul took him back. Look what happened. He ends up writing a book of our New Testament. Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. Wow. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Be with the way that you think. Be with your mind because this is a psychology book. Best one ever written. Best one by far ever written. You need some counseling. You need to give counsel. Have the book of Philemon at ready fingertip. In the mind. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not be with your body. Not be with your physical. But be with your spirit. Well, no part of the New Testament more clearly demonstrates integrated Christian thinking and living, compacted in such a short, neat, concise book. It offers a blend utterly characteristic of the Apostle Paul, and it shows how he left a life of thinking differently to a life of thinking spiritual. As he left the old law under Judaism, that physical law, he left to a law that was more spiritual in nature. The conclusion of this letter can lead us to ask, as Paul says, amen, let it be, is what amen means. He's saying, let it be in your life. Let it be in my life. Let this thinking permeate our spirits. Will we? You know, we can have a head full of knowledge, but we have to have a spirit full of application. And I hope that we can do this. Looking forward uh, so much to being together very soon. And I hope that you are growing in spirit and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks for joining me.